the last time we were here, I presented to you what we called deal sealers. And I've adopted that term when we are able to prove without a doubt that things we have possessed here or proposed here are true. I mean, you know, it's very difficult in any kind of a church setting or gathering to prove things. But it's very important that we look at these things and say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe a lot of people don't come here. Maybe a lot of people make fun of this. But nonetheless, we're the only place that can prove what we say. And the last time we were here, I presented to you work done by researcher Hitoshi Hakimura, who is a circadian biologist at Kyoto University in Japan, who, along with his researchers, uh, did something quite spectacular that we've been talking about here for months. In other words, what I have been proposing to you is that what we call and what we have learned to call the soul is actually photon. Okay, it's light particles that are inside of our body, intelligent light that operates the body. In other words, that's who we are. Our personality, our soul, our spirit is actually photon. And so what uh, Hitoshi Akamura in Tokyo did was he got into a room and he had people standing there or sitting there and he had cameras focused on them and the lights were turned off. It was pitch black. There was absolutely no light whatsoever. And he left the cameras on uh, in a time-lapse type of a thing for 10 minutes. Uh, let me show you uh, what he said as to what they did. The human body, he said, literally glows emitting a visible light in extremely small quantities at levels that rise and fall with the day. To learn more about this faint visible light, scientists in Japan employed extraordinarily sensitive cameras capable of detecting single photons. Five male volunteers in their 20s were placed in front of the camera darkness for 20 minutes every three hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Researcher Hitoshi Akimura biologist at Kyoto University in Japan. <coughs> now, what happened was they were able to show us, and this just happened a couple of weeks ago, they were able to show us the first pictures ever taken of the human soul, the first pictures ever taken of the human spirit. And these are the pictures. You see? There they are. I mean, there was no lights on these people. It was a pitch black room. The light that you see is coming from the people. Now, not only does that prove that what they call soul or what they call spirit is photon, but it proves the aura. I've had people who sit and, and, and watch me and, and say, uh, I, I, several times people will say, well, you know, I just wanted to tell you, I don't know, anything, but I saw this like blue or green light around you. And I always said, hey, 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 you know, because that's, I guess it's okay. But that proves it, doesn't it? We all have blue or green light around us. You see, there's proof. There is scientific proof that what operates our body, we as beings inside of these physical bodies, are photon. And now there's a picture of it. There's a picture of your soul or your spirit right there. Now, the point that makes it so interesting and why we push so hard on this photon business is because it says in the Bible, God is not a man, God is light. So if what we call God is not a man, and if what we call God is light, then God has to be photon. There's no other thing it can be. And if Jesus is the son of God, Jesus is the son of Photon, and if we are created in the image and likeness of God, then we are Photon as well. And there's the proof. You see? Um, and I, Charles, you mind me telling the story about you? 
Okay, Charles, as you know, has had uh, cancer, and he's been going through treatment for it, and he's doing very well. I get completely excited, but I'll tell you why I'm more excited than ever. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard this, and Joan's been a nurse for how many, 116 years or whatever? <laughs> and it's the first time she's ever heard this. But Charles has been gone for radiation uh, for the brain, you know. And uh, Maxine was down with him at the hospital, and while Charles was laid out there, she was asking one of the tech, uh, technical people, you know, what, what is happening? What's going on there? And the technician or whoever the radiologist said, we are bombarding his head with photons. And I thought, wow. I've said this in some of these born-again churches years ago, but boy, this is a good time to say hallelujah. Because, uh, you know, if God is photons, he's getting bombarded with God. Do you see how exciting this is? Once you know. Once you know. And I'll tell you something, when you look around, and maybe you'll see him later, but uh, two weeks ago, he couldn't even hardly walk. And uh, he's strutting again. And, and so I'm very excited about that. And so there you see... Uh, the photons. Um, but there was a couple other deal sealers because, you know, people have come in here and some people, I mean, so, to some people, this is a regular religious place. They come back every every two or three years. They're here like clockwork, you know. And I mean, uh, it, it's really exciting to see them. I said, well, you're back, yes. And But what comes out of this place, you can take out of here and and prove, you know what I mean? No matter what they say. So this is one thing. There's a picture of the soul. There's a picture of the spirit. There was another one. I proposed um, back in 1997 that Supernova 1987 was the seventh seal of the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation is Greek mythology. There is nothing religious in it. It is pure Greek mythology, built around all types of symbolisms. And so I looked and I saw the seventh seal uh, of Revelation because of the, the, the fire in the center. But I said, you know, I needed a deal seal or of some kind. And I, I thought I had a pretty strong case. But then recently, something came to my attention. That was a deal sealer. Here are the seven angels in the book of Revelation. Look at the seven angels in the book of Revelation. And what does it say? It says, Upon the cloud one set like the sun, on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And in the next one, another angel, thrust in your sickle. And then the next one, and he thrust in his sickle. And another angel, and number 17, having a sharp sickle. And another angel had power over fire, and he said, thrust in your sharp sickle. Sickle, and the angel thrust in his sickle and gathered the vine of the earth and the wine press and the wrath of God. All the sickles on the seventh angel. Well, lo and behold, something came along from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration that sealed the deal for us. And this is it. Here's a picture from NASA. And look at the thing. The white sickle-shaped material in the center is the visible part of the shredded star rushing out at 3,000 kilometers. The seventh seal of the book of Revelation in the center of the eye on fire is a sickle. That's a deal sealer. And, and I don't really care who says anything. And you don't have to care. Anything. You, you go to any church from here to wherever you want to go and Get me proof like that from them of anything they've ever said. And I've given you, just given you two proofs. I proposed that a Karina was the seventh angel of the book of Revelation. And, 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 you know, one of the amazing things about it is that it says that, uh, Etika, it says the seventh angel of the book of Revelation is connected to the son of David. That's in Revelation. Well then, let me show you this from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. What does it say? The Chandra image contains some puzzling things. This is about Eta Carina, of how a star can produce such intense x-rays, agreed Professor Chris David's son. Couldn't his name be anything? Couldn't it be Chris Kringle? Or couldn't it be Joe Blow? 
or Alpha or Yorah. Could it be any billion, trillion, skillion name? But what is his name? And he's connected with Eta Karina, the seventh angel. David's son. His name is the son of David. And he's at the University of Minnesota investigator for the Eta Karina observations by Hubble. There's three deal sealers. Three. Oh, you say, wow, these are all coincidences. Yeah. They're not coincidences. I propose galaxy NG4555 is the location where light beings who oversee the work on Earth is done. In other words, where they live. The photons, if you wish, come from NGC4555. The deal sealer was I was manager of the cable company up in Bricktown in Point Pleasant for 22 years. And they have a 250-foot tower out there. And it wasn't until I left that particular position that somebody showed me and wanted me to check the uh, 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 coordinates of the tower out there that I saw something that made me fall out of the chair. For 20 years I sat there next to that, uh, uh, that tower bringing information down from space. And let me show you the license, the Federal Aeronautics and Space uh, Administration license. What does it say the latitude is? 4555. If that was 4655 or 4155 or 4, it's 4555. It's a deal sealer. <laughs> I don't need any more. You see, well, that's why I get so confident about this stuff. Because what comes flying in is absolute proof. I mean, I was talking about 4555 for what, 20 years? And then finally I, I see the copy of this thing and it's 4555. It's, it's good enough. You see. Those of you who have been listening to me for many years know that I said many, many years ago what Jesus meant when he said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And what do we say? If you stimulate the pineal gland of your body, your body will fill with melatonin. And we were talking about melatonin 20 years ago. And what did we recently see from science? Remember, Jesus said, if your eye be single, pineal gland, your body will fill with light. Now what does this say? The pineal gland or epiphysis synthesizes and secretes melatonin, a structurally simple hormone that communicates information about environmental lighting to various parts of the body. The light transducing ability of the pineal gland has led some to call the pineal the third eye. Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Scientists say that the pineal gland secretes melatonin that communicates information about environmental lighting to various parts of the body. That's a deal sealer. That's proof. Go across the street to the church. Ask them, what, show me some proof. You know what they're going to say? You need faith. And what? And me? You gotta believe what I say because I'm Pastor McFeely. Stop. But I mean, aren't people? Can't we be? Um, can't we be intelligent enough and mature enough to say, "My God, this, you're seeing all of this stuff, even coming out of scriptures, because of the fact that it was all written by Greek." mythologist and who had access to the works of Democrates and Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Diogenes and all of these eases who knew all of this stuff. Consider the word epiphysis. See it there? The pineal gland or epiphysis. The pineal gland in the center of your brain, which is the light receptor of the brain, <coughs> It's called epiphysis. If you look up the word epiphysis in any dictionary, it will say the pineal gland. If you look up the word pineal gland, it will say epiphysis. Now, consider the word epiphysis, then consider the word epiphany. Consider that the epiphysis or pineal gland is the seventh seal, the seventh chakra. The, that point of kundalini or enlightenment. All right? It's the place of enlightenment. Now, what does the word epiphany mean? An epiphany from ancient Greek 
manifestation, a striking appearance, the sudden realization or comprehension of the largest essence or meaning of something, a divine manifestation. So then why do they call the pineal gland the single eye epiphysis, which means a divine manifestation, an appearance of divine or superhuman being, an illuminating realization of discovery, often resulting in personal feeling of elation, awe, or wonder. Why do they call the single eye, the pineal gland of the brain, epiphysis? If that's not what it's... Because that is what reveals the manifestation of the higher photon lights that we call God and Jesus. It is through the single eye. And that is the thing that religious people avoid like the plague, manifesting the light through the single eye in meditation. And when they do that, they miss the entire Jesus message. Entirely. (coughs) Because epiphany doesn't happen in a church. Epiphany doesn't happen on some holiday. Epiphany happens in your brain. And that's the proof. Because epiphany, epiphysis, is the pineal gland of the brain and the pineal gland is in the center of your brain. That's the proof. Now, I show you these things because I want you to have confidence in what you're seeing and what you're hearing here. I have never since I have been here, I have never said anything and told you, well, you should believe this way, or you should have faith. Every single time that I have ever been here, ever said a word, I have provided scientific proof about what I've said. And I have given you the names of the scientists or the physicists who said it, and I have showed you the scriptures in the Bible where it coordinates. Now, the information that we're getting here And you're seeing here, it's obviously coming from some place, from somebody. Nobody else is saying this, so why? Who is it? Look around. I don't know. Where is it? Who's in this room with us? Who's feeding me? Well, you know, isn't it amazing? Who's in this room with us? Some guy standing here we can't see? Checking on me if I'm saying the right stuff. to say. But when your frequency shifts here in the upcoming 24, you'll see this guy. What has been said here about the unknown has been proven to be true in the world of the known. And the reason that I'm shouting it out this time is because we're running out of time in our approach to the 24, and I want you to be confident that nothing will ever be said from this speaker's platform that is not proven scientifically. Nothing. Now, in our last meeting together, we hit on two points that stirred interest. One, I said Adam and Eve are not two people. Adam and Eve is a mythology story. I mean, what were two English people doing in the middle of this primeval place? Adam and Eve are part of us. Adam and Eve are parts of the male and the female psyche in every being. You all have Adam and you all have Eve. We all do. Some people have a little too much Adam. Some people have a little too much Eve. But I mean, that's not the problem. I, that's, I'm not going to get into that. The second point, Exodus, is not something that happened in Egypt. It never happened. There never were hundreds of thousands of Jewish people roaming around the desert. There never was a guy who was able to open the Red Sea so everybody can run across. It never happened. It is much more important than that. It happens to every human being and the face of the planet in here. Exodus is in your brain where you make your escape from the bondage of the material and the doctrinal and the governmental and the corporate and the religious left side that imprint, whatever the word is, that screws your head up and so that you can cross the Red Sea, which is the corpus colossum of the brain, to the promised land, which is the right side. Now, the idea of Adam and Eve representing 
not two people, but that which is in every living being is in the Bible. I don't. I, you know, I wouldn't make this stuff up. I don't have any right to make things up and just say, "Listen, uh, there was no Adam and Eve. Uh, this, this is Adam and Eve, or one person inside of you." So you, could, you could look at me and you say, well, "How the heck were you get off saying that?" I'll show you where I get off saying that. I get off saying it because Genesis 5.1 says, Male and female created he them and called their name Adam. End of discussion. Now, I mean, how long have you been alive and, and people say, well, you know, that woman was the one that screwed everything up because the snake told her to eat the apple. And then, you know, she... Anybody could tell you when a snake comes up and says something, you really shouldn't listen to them. <laughs> Jesus. You know, no wonder we're all nuts. Brilliant people. you got doctors and scientists and all of this, and they come in church and they check their brains at the door and they sit there and they listen to this guy tell them about the snake, tell the lady to eat the apple, and, then, and from that goes to everything to get screwed up. <coughs> the lady did it, so she's got to wear a hat when she goes in a church now. So there it is. We are all male and we are all female. The male part is the physical and the intellectual. Uh The female part is the emotional, boo-hoo, and the spiritual. And so they've got to come together like that and that makes the complete person. And yet religion of all kinds all over the world have taken that stupid story about a woman talking to a snake and used that to oppress women from the earliest possible time. And I mean, you've got some places now where a woman walks around and she's got a windshield in the front of her face to see out. So the Bible itself makes it clear that in the story, religion has misinterpreted to subvert the woman under the man. Adam is both Adam and Eve. It is one being. It is one mind that is both intellect and emotion. And it was the emotion that gave in to the serpent. Well, who's the serpent? If you feel around the back, you'll see a thing that goes up your back, you know, and that's the serpent. That's the spine. And when the serpent can rise as the kundalini serpent or it can be the aggressive bodily function that uh, causes us to get in all kinds of trouble. But not understanding this has caused religion to bring down a formal bondage against women even though it says in the book it's all male and female. There was no two people that are any different than either they're all called Adam and they're all male and female. So it wasn't a woman that did this. <coughs> it was, <coughs> excuse me, the emotional part of our being that gives in to the temptations to do wrong. But what did we do? We deliberately, when I say we, I'm talking about the religions of the world, deliberately manipulated the mythology to literally literally create a bizarre social order in which women are considered less than men. Not on the basis of intelligence, but on the basis of their sex. And that was a deliberate thing that was done. I mean, come on. Do you, did you ever read the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Oh, I know, but that just means mankind. Oh, no, it does not, because until 75 years ago, women were not allowed to vote under the Declaration of Independence. Oh, no, it meant all men are created equal. And it comes from the crap that poured out from religion when they misinterpreted the scriptures and said, the woman talked to the snake. And consider Consider it was only a hundred years ago when women in this country were allowed to vote. How can something like this, which permeates all of religion, 
be considered good. It is the epitome of evil. And yet it is the foundation of religion. The foundation of religion is the epitome of evil because they deliberately degrade one party of the human life experience, namely the female. There's another amazing point in the Bible is in Exodus where God planned to do bad things. And Moses by telling God that it was a bad idea, actually got God to change his mind. You know, and, 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 you, and these churches, they said, yes, he really talked to them and said, oh, God, you're really a bad God. You are a bad God and you are screwing this whole thing up for everybody. And God is saying, oh boy, I guess you're right, Mo. I'll never do that again. Jesus, I mean, come on, where are we? And we're all out there sitting listening, and then we get done telling us this damn stupid story. We get up and sing, This is the day that the Lord has made. We're all nuts. Take a show of some. Exodus 32 11. And Moses said to God, Why are you losing your temper? The Egyptians will say you brought them out of the desert to kill them in the mountains and wipe them out from the face of the earth. Turn away! And repent of this evil against your people, you nasty God. What kind of God are you? So here's a man telling God to cool it and control his temper. And God changes his mind. Because Moses explained. But this isn't the end of the story. This is, this is great. You know what happens here? God gets pissed. And it says in the next thing, Exodus, and the Lord said to Moses, when you return, uh, uh, come, 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 come to the tavern, uh, and, I, and I'm going to meet you there. And it says that God was going to kill him. The Lord planned to kill Moses. Yeah. So they were going to meet at the uh, Desert Inn, I guess. Have a, have a knock back a couple of cool ones, Moses and God. God was going to say, Mo, you know, you really got me pissed off the other night and uh, no hard feelings. But hey, take this sucker. Bang, bang. Yeah. And this is the Bible. The Word of God. So there is. God's hero is Moses and he's looking to get him at a tavern to kill him. Now, Al Vero raised an interesting question. Because I said all these stories are mythology and they're all talking about what's going on inside of your brain. See? Your will is Moses. That photon in there is Moses. You open the Red Sea when you make a way in meditation to cross over to the Promised Land, which is the right hemisphere. And the Pharaoh is religion government. It, it, it could be the job. It, it could be the corporation. It could be the systems that hold you in bondage so that you don't know what to do. You, you can't figure out which way to turn. But Al raised an interesting question. Obviously, this is mythology. Because we have a man conversing with God and telling God he better change his ways. And this would obviously be a story to explain the workings of the mind. In other words, Think of this. Because Al said, well, now wait a minute. If, if you're saying that Moses was talking to God and talked God out of doing something and God changed his mind, how do you bring that into our heads, each one of us? I mean, how does that fit into our heads? How can we rationalize this? God's planning to do evil Moses talks him out of it. How can it be rationalized as an activity of the mind? And so I, I did a little meditation. I always do. I really do. I sit and I hold my breath and I just sit for a while and eh, maybe 10, 15 seconds. And what we have to do is we have to look at the entire myth. What is this myth about? It's about escaping 
from the mental and physical bondage to a new experience. But still, as Al said, how do you fit in God talking with a man and the man getting God to change his mind? How can that be explained as something inside of our head? So let's back off a bit, start at the beginning, and let's try to put some common sense here in arriving at a conclusion. You ready? This is a story. The story was written in a book by people. Uh-huh. There was no angel hanging in the sky with a ballpoint pen writing <laughs> and then handing it down. Can you reach up here a little higher? That didn't happen. People sat in a room and wrote with whatever they wrote with in those days. And those people were supervised in what they were writing. There is no doubt as to where the story was written and who wrote it. There are differing opinions regarding the origin of the Septuagint, which was translated by Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria, Egypt. According to one tradition, it was begun specifically at the request of Ptolemy Philadelphus, who wished to have a copy of the Bible for the great Alexandrian library. Seventy-two skilled Jewish language experts were brought to Egypt where they first translated the Pentateuch, Exodus, and so forth, and then the rest of what is commonly known as the Old Testament from the original Hebrew. So what they did, when Alexander the Great went through Israel, he was looking to gather up some pay, and he, he got some of these guys that were writers, and they said, you know, we really would like to, to go along and, and write you know, under the Greek literature, Greek mythology. So they, they went up there. They, they were called Hellenists. So now the Bible is being turned from old stories of tribal traditions that were into this well-versed book that was written in Alexandria, Egypt, and now becomes filled with Greek mythology. And I'll tell you something. The Septuagint is not ever used by Jewish people because they said there are absurdities in it. The absurdities that they find is the Greek mythology. And that's what this whole thing is. So we have a group of people under the direction of Greek Ptolemies with access to Greek science writing a story in mythology. They talk among themselves. They were directed by Greek Ptolemies as to how this was all to come out. Now, you've got to keep in, you gotta keep in mind, we'll cover this up, you've got to keep in mind that the uh, archaeolo archaeological department of the University of Tel Aviv says that after 200 years of archaeological expeditions and excavations all over the place, they've never found one thing that's in the Bible. It, it, not, nothing happened. So, which again proves it. But here we have... Now there's something very important here as we consider that this is a story written by people under Greek authority. Socrates had set the standard about what you and I would be looking for. I had a guy write me, he said, well, you know, you... You put down this word God. There were gods who came in Samaria and uh, there were gods that came down to the earth and all these gods. And I wrote back, I said, don't tell me they're gods because the word God originated with Socrates. Anything before that, they might have called them aliens of some kind, but they weren't gods because the word God comes from the word good which was the Greek word that Socrates used to define the highest realm of existence that would bring us to the light mind. Here it was Socrates here. And as you can see, Socrates, the idea that humans possess virtues formed a common thread in Socrates. Virtue is the most valuable. The ideal life was spent in search of the good. 
ultimately, virtue relates to the form of the good. To be truly good, not just in acting with right opinion, one must come to know the unchanging good in itself. That was the first time, and it made its way into the scriptures, that the word good was used to portray a higher realm of being, and it became the word God. Before that time, the word God was never used. It's very important. So this opens us to a deeper understanding of Moses interacting with God to follow up on what Al said. And here now Moses is going to change God's mind. Now when we really understand what was being written, the interaction that goes on, we now find, goes on in all of our minds between what is good and what is evil. Even in our little everyday affairs. I think this is a good idea. But no, that might really screw things up for uh, Renee. Or, you know, maybe I better change my... So let's go to the Greek. We are Moses. And that's what the story is about. You and I are Moses. And we're dealing with ourselves. The constant talking that goes on within our mind. Seems like a good idea to me. Yeah. That would be a God idea. Does it make sense to you? People in a room writing the words in this story, they use the reference of Socrates seeking a good, and then the idea of Moses talking with God is the concept of you and me considering things which we perceive to be Good. I think this is a good idea. I think, I think if I park my car, even if it's on that other guy's lawn, sounds like a good idea to me. Oh, now wait a minute. He's liable to really get ticked off. Yeah, I better. F- maybe I better not do this. When you come up with a good idea. And then, you talk yourself out of it, Moses has just gotten God to repent. Do you, do you understand where I'm coming from? The idea of God changing his mind is the concept that though we felt that a particular idea was good, that means it's a God idea, there were other circumstances that influenced us to move away from that concept to another path to accomplish the desired result. And so God repented or changed his mind or good was changed. What we thought was good was not good. What we thought was God was not God. I am going to go up to the hospital and visit Beatrice. That's good. That's God. On my way to the hospital, I think I'll stop it and rob the bank. (laughs) That'll be good. I'll have money to buy flowers for Beatrice. (laughs) Wait a minute now. I thought that was a good idea, but there might be cops in the area. I better not do that. Good God has repented. Do you understand? So the entire conversation between Moses and God as to what is right and what is wrong is the conversation that you and I have all the time with ourselves deciding on we're going to do this, we're going to do that, or we're going to change this. And what we perceive to be good then turns out to be not so good. Now, we've got another part of the story that still lingers. God wants to meet Moses at the desert inn and blow his head off. The idea that God sought to kill Moses at the inn is the concept that decisions that we are always making in the busyness of our own mind become the inn. That's why Jesus could never be born in the inn. 
Because the Christ cannot be born inside of us where all the business is going on. It has to be born in the quiet place of nature where the animals are, which is the right side. And so, <coughs> when we come up with ideas out of the busyness of our brain and we have not submitted to meditation at all, then many times the ideas are contrary to developing a good result. Thus, the good thoughts start to begin to overwhelm those thoughts that are from the lower and they start to push down those things that are obstructing us from accomplishing good. Now, let me, let me see if I can, let me see if I can figure this. If we're getting so many ideas that are, we think are good, but they're coming out of the busyness of the mind where we're getting all kinds of thoughts, we might not be thinking clearly. And so good seeks to kill this out of us, which occurs in meditation when we separate from ourselves. When we separate from ourselves in meditation, we are actually dead. We're dead to the busyness of the left side. We're dead to the various thoughts that could wind up getting us in trouble. And so it is necessary that we have to be killed in the busy place of the left side so that can, we can be restored in, quote-unquote, the holy place of the right side. So good then seeks to kill us. In other words, it seeks to destroy our activity in the busy side so that we can then be brought into a oneness in the holy side. And that's how these stories work. See? I mean, just common sense tells you there was some god somewhere, you want to kill this guy, well, what would he do? Just point at him. It's the end of that. I'd have to meet him in a restaurant. You see? You see, when, when you look about being killed by the right side, you think of the words in the Bible that say, I die daily. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when you commit a meditation, the lights are down. You shut down the thoughts of the left side. Oh, I know. Maybe you get 10 or 15 seconds. But you shut it down. You're dead. You're dead to the world. You're dead to the left side. And there in the end, good has killed you for good's purpose. If we start to look at these stories as mythology and try to determine what they mean instead of whether they really happened, will benefit by the teaching. And that's our problem. Nobody tries to figure out, what's the story mean? How can I benefit? How can I change? How can the world be changed? No, we go looking on a mountain for a piece of wood to prove that Noah's Ark was there. That's what we do. Nobody cares what Jesus said. Nobody cares what Jesus taught. They're just trying to prove that he existed. And they can't prove that because he didn't. In a physical realm. If we started to be more concerned with his teachings than whether he existed, we would begin to benefit by those teachings and the world would be a much, much better place. But this isn't what happened. Religion has changed the direction Jesus required people to go in order for them to be the saviors instead of him. Come to church and be saved. In other words, the approach of Jesus was that a person would respond to his teachings and have a mind change. Religion, on the other hand, wants people to respond to their teachings. Say, come to them and be saved. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a scripture that religion uses today, and you, you talk to a born-again Christian, 
and they all know it like the back of their hand. It says, If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so it happens. People are invited to services and they have what they call an altar call at the end. You saw Jimmy, uh, Billy, whatever, what was his name? Billy Graham do that all the time. <laughs> I do a blank on a guy's name. But anyhow, they, they come to these services and everybody says, oh, everybody bow your head, please. Bow your head. I want you to say after me, repeat this prayer, I invite Jesus, I believe God raised you from the dead, and I want you to be my Lord, and come into my life and be that, be my Lord. Now, with eyes closed, nobody looking around, keep your head bowed, everybody who's said that prayer, raise your hand. And then the character will say, I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Oh, I see that hand. We've got three people saved. Jesus, that reminds me of the joke at the time that the lifeguard got sick at the beach and there was a minister there and he was sunbathing and the lifeguard said, i got to go to the bathroom. Would you sit up here for a minute? And uh, the minister said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sit up there. And then it, uh, there was a, all of a sudden out in the ocean there was a guy drowning. He was going like that and the minister was saying, I see that hand, you're safe. <laughs> But you hear people talk to one another as to when they were saved. I've heard people say, I was saved when I was five years old. I attended an altar call. And what they mean by that is, when did you bow your head and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm not saying anything out of school because you can go on TV and watch it. But there's a serious flaw here. And it means that literally billions of people who have come away from church thinking they were saved, have not been saved and are forever lost because they think they're saved when they're not. They confess Jesus as their Lord. They are bowing their hand and say, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Hallelujah. Raise your hand. But there's a problem with that. And this is the problem. The Jesus of the Bible says, Why do you call me Lord and do not the things which I say? Oh, now wait a minute. They didn't tell me I, uh, that was involved. All I was had to do was just sit down and say something. No, no. No, you've got to do what I tell you to do. Acts 5.32, We are His witnesses, so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. Not them that sit in the chair and bow your head. That's not part of the deal. And Hebrews, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. When I tell people this in emails, they write me and they say, well, you're saying works. Jesus died for my sins. I say, I'm, I could care less what he died for. I'm telling you what he said to do. And if you're going to thumb your nose at it, don't give me the salvation crap because it doesn't work. So, religion has taken the biblical statement that if you confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved, which has people by the millions believing they are saved because they confess Jesus as their Lord. But what that does, it eliminates them from actively seeking a salvation, which Jesus in the Bible says is based not on saying anything, but on obedience to his teachings. They just eliminate it. And when one is not in obedience to the teachings of Jesus, one does not realize that the most important point in salvation is meditation. If you're going to be saved from the corporations, from the governments, if you're going to be saved from religion, if you're going to be saved from the lady next door, if you're going to be saved from all kinds of horrors that infest your mind, then you've got to be obedient to Jesus Christ and enter into meditation so your mind can be changed. But they don't do that. And so they miss salvation. Now religion has made a serious error. They, this is what, they believe salvation means not going to hell. I'm saved, I'm not going to hell. Whoa! I'm going straight up. 
Right on to the front gates. <laughs> they believe it. But you know why they believe that? They, they believe that hell is someplace you go after you die. But the Bible disagrees. Hell is not some place you go after you die. It is some place you experience when you are alive. And to be saved means to rise in consciousness above those mind things that keep us in hell. Look. It's in the book. What does it say? The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from the hell beneath. What does that mean? Above is the higher realm of the mind. And as you ascend in meditation, you rise above the hell that is beneath in the lower part of the mind. What does it say? The sorrows of hell surround me. What does that mean? Everything is screwed up. I don't know what the hell is going on. All I know is I wish I was dead. That's being in hell. Go ahead. For great is your mercy toward me. You took my soul from the lowest hell. These are all people that are alive. And what does it say? I cried to the Lord because of my trouble. He heard me out of the belly of hell I crowed, and you heard my voice. Religion changed the whole Bible, my friends. Not one thing that's in the Bible do they talk about. Not one thing do they, do they have right. So there's biblical proof. Salvation is not something that comes after you die. It is available to you while you are alive. <clears throat> but you have to find the way of life which is above and it comes through meditation. So by not obeying Jesus Christ, by obeying religion, you're all in hell. And, and everybody's gone to hell. They're all in hell. A terrible thing. They go to church and they sing the songs. Amazing grace so sweet. And then they go home and they're throwing, on, they're throwing stuff at one another. Listen, Beatrice, get the hell out of here. I should have never married you. Huh? Oh, shut up. You're making the kids upset, Harold. Oh, I don't give a damn. That's what, I, that's, what that, that's what goes on. It's all hell. Because there's never a time to purge all of that crap out of their mind. Now, another thing they miss is physical enlightenment. Enlightenment to the brain. Jesus made a very specific reference to I showed you before, and it is... Here, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. The pineal gland of the brain. The single eye, the pineal gland, filled with light. Now look at scientific reality. Let's compare. Come on, let's look at it. Matthew 6, 22, if your eye be single, pineal gland, your body will fill with light. Genesis 32, 30, I have seen God face to face. I will call this place pineal. Over there, the pineal gland of Ephesus Structurally simple hormone that communicates information about environmental, environmental lighting to various parts of the body. I mean, there it is. There it is. <coughs> so by bowing your head and saying Jesus is Lord instead of obeying Jesus and entering within yourself to stimulate the pineal, People miss what Jesus offered them. Namely, a new mind, a new understanding, a new healing from the power of the lower realm. That's what salvation is. And that's the disaster that has fallen upon millions and millions of religious people thinking they are saved. Don't they ever wonder, if I'm saved, what the hell's going on? If I'm saved, why did I lose my job? If I'm saved, what, you know, why, why are all these terrible things happening? Instead of creating a heaven upon earth, these very people who claim Jesus is their Lord are creating hell. Let me tell you something. When you bomb innocent people in a place like Iraq, you have created hell. When you deprive people of health care, you have created hell. When you allow people to starve throughout the world, you have created hell. When you torture animals and you violate nature, you have created hell. They're trying to get saved from going to hell and they're the very ones creating it. And they make up stories about the Bible and they don't treat the Bible as a symbolic writing. And they use the book to threaten and frighten people. And the book is just the opposite. It exists to show people how to avoid being frightened and how to avoid being threatened. 
They create a God who, who tortures his son to death when the crucifixion is a symbolic story of quantum entanglement of photons. They create a God who wants people to pour water on their head when baptism is actually an elevation to a higher stage of the mind. They create a God who wants women to be treated less than men when the Bible states all human beings are created male and female. They create a God made in the image and likeness of themselves. Violent, oppressive, judgmental, and filled with hate. But they do worse than that. They convince disturbed people that whatever they do is okay as long as they get saved by accepting Jesus. Just this week, this week, a man walked into a L.A. fitness center in Pittsburgh and began shooting people. And he left a diary. And on the internet, they've revealed what it says in the diary. Now, where did he get this from? And you see why it's okay to go out and do whatever you want because the pastor said, I'm saved. Look at this from his diary. Maybe soon I'll see God in Jesus. At last, that's what I was told. Eternal life does not depend on works. If it did, we'd all be in hell. Christ paid for every sin. So how can I or you be judged by God for a sin when the penalty was already paid? People judge, but that doesn't matter. I was reading the Bible and the integrity of God beginning yesterday because soon I will see them. So if I go in and shoot eight or ten people, nah, it's not going to hurt my salvation because Jesus paid for it and I accepted Him. I'm okay. Get my guns. Where do you get this one from? Good luck to Obama. He'll be successful. The liberal media loves him. America has chosen the black man. Good. Every black man should get a young white girl ho to hone up on. Long ago, many an older white male lay in order had a young Negro wench for his desires. About time tables are turned. Besides, them young white hoes dig the brothers. More so than they dig the white dudes. You do the math. There are enough young whites so all the brothers can each have one. Do you see how these people are programmed? You, you've seen all of the anti-black and racist stuff that's going on in this country since Obama, coming out of the radio stations and these guys on all that. People are programmed. And they're stimulated by groups of one kind or another that have an agenda. And when they stimulate people such as this who go over the edge, the result is mass murder. And the groups that agitated sick minds, they go on to their next project totally oblivious that they were accessories to this murder. Whether they are religion, government, or corporate. Couldn't somebody have told this guy that even though you've accepted Jesus, that doesn't mean you're saved if you go around killing people? No. You know why they couldn't tell him that? Because they don't believe that. They believe you are. They don't believe it is necessary to be in obedience to anything like that. They're guilty of murder when they fill sick minds with the type of agitation they do. We John and I were in churches years ago <coughs> where they would tell people, you're healed, you're healed. I'll lay hands on you. You're healed in the name of Jesus. Enter Jesus. Heal. And we'd seen people go out and throw their pills at, uh, from uh, epilepsy or they throw them in the ocean. And then have a fit and the next thing you know, there they go saved and all in the ambulance heading to the hospital. Because wherever you speak, there can be people sitting listening to you who are somewhat disturbed and will take what you say literally and look at them. And to create this violent God they referred to earlier and the fear-filled lifestyle they use a book that they swear is absolutely true. I believe every word of the word of God. But here's an archaeologist from the University of Tel Aviv in the center of Israel, of all places. And what does he say? The many Egyptian documents do not make any reference to the sojourn of the children of Israel in Egypt or the events of the Exodus. It didn't happen. Now you say, you're looking at me. I didn't say that. This guy's an archaeologist in Israel. He's got the records of 200 years of excavations and he says it never happened. 
Generations of scholars tried to locate Mount Sinai and the stations of the tribes of Israel. Despite all of this diligent research, not one site was identified that corresponds to the biblical picture. Professor Ziv Herzog, Tel Aviv University. So we have a book that groups around the world have convinced humans around the world was written by a person called God. A person whose name is taken from the word good penned by Socrates. And in writing this book, the God in the sky picked a bunch of people to assemble in Alexandria, Egypt, which is the center of Zeus worship, to write in mythology. So his followers could take all of this symbolic language and interpret it literally. Then, when it came time to have the book translated into English, this God picked a gay guy from England who was in the middle of a 14-year love affair with a gay dude from France. And the English gay guy, who just happened to be a king, in defense of his sexual preference, stated that what he did was okay because Jesus did the same thing. And this book, written in the center of Zeus worship by a bunch of people using Greek mythology, was handed down from generation to generation, edited by generation and generation, and you're told, if you don't believe every word of it, you're going to hell. So, let me just show you, and we're wrapping up here, the different versions of the Bible, okay? Take a look at this. This is, some, this is just a handful. There's millions of them. Here you got the Luther, the Worldwide, 21st, American Standard, Amplified, Dewey, whatever, the New Century, New International, Today's Young's Literal. Here you have publishing companies who have put together their version of the Bible. They gather together their particular editors and come up with what they think it should say. And then you get it and you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Oh, you can't. You have to believe it or you're going to hell. It doesn't make any difference which version it is. No one's allowed to question it. See? But nobody tells you which version to question. There is a website... This is great. And we'll wrap up here. There's a website called BibleBelievers.com. You've got you to gotta go there. They have a page called Bible Versions. And I, and I wanted to give you an idea of what they say about the Bible versions. This is a strict born-again website. Now remember, this is the Bible, a book that no one can question. I mean, you know, you could be walking down the street and somebody come up and say, here, sister or brother, I want you to have a Bible, the Word of God. And they give you one of these. Now get this guy. Get this. I'm not saying this. I don't get to, This is what this guy said. Look what he says. Did the Catholic Church give us the Bible? By David W. Daniels. Written in a down-to-earth style and packed with cartoon illustrations by Jack Chick. Daniel shows that the Bible of Rome gave us a really clever counterfeit designed to eliminate God's preserved words in English. Clever counterfeits. Huh. How would I know it's a clever counterfeit? Do I have to believe that one? Or do I just say I don't believe the Bible? Or do I have to say, or do they say, well, you don't believe which Bible? Look at the next one. Believers, beware, that's, I got misspelled, beware of counterfeit King James. A thorough critique of various Bible publishers who have changed the text of the King James Bible. The article contains an excellent checklist for those wishing to purchase a faithful. Wait a minute. Publishers have changed the text? Oh my God. But I gotta believe this. It's the Bible. Go to the next one, John. Let's see what else is there. Testimony of another supporter, Frank Logston. Logston was an early supporter of the New American Stand, published by good friend Franklin Dewey of the Lock. Read how much Logston regretted his association with this corrupt translation. I got it. I am really upset by this. It's a corrupt translation, and the whole, the whole town, they, 
Everybody in church has that. Now, what are the people in church is going to, if they have that? In other words, all you people in church, if you go to church Sunday and, and they give you the American Standard Bible, you're going to have to raise hell in here. You're going to have to do like they're doing at these meetings, these town halls, and stand up and say, We want mother. We want out. No, no, no. Then you've got to raise hell in here. Don't stand for it because, as you can see, it's corrupt. Look at the next one. One book stands alone, The Key to Believing the Bible by Douglas Stoffer. This book in the excerpt contained was written to clearly help strengthen the faith of those who believe the Bible and counter the multi prong attacks by Satan. I knew he'd get into it. <coughs> Christ's sinless perfection and the total elimination to certain key verses. No, I can't believe it. Do you mean to tell me that there are publishers who are eliminating certain key verses and doctrines in the Bible? My God, how can we believe this? But look at this next one. This one is really going to blow your mind. The New King James Version counterfeit changed more than the these and thous. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of changes from the old. Read this fascinating expose on the corrupt nature of this popular Bible. It's corrupt. Corrupt. Millions of people walking around with a corrupt Bible. Oh, how they're all screwed up and they're thinking of saved and what the hell they're reading. I, and look at Ripped Out of the Bible by Floyd Jones, a detailed look at the way modern Bible translations have omitted thousands of words in comparison to our beloved. So what we're supposed to believe is that it's up to the individual reader to find the Bible that contains the truth, God's Word. Even though this Christian website admits that many versions exist and accuses some of them of being corrupt and having the words changed. <clears throat> I promise you to stop, and I, and I promise you after this next scripture we will. But I want to just give you an example of difficult things to consider. Just looking at the scripture. <coughs> Forget whether the Bible has been changed by these publishers, these satanic rascals. But take a look at this scripture. And remember, this has got to be taken literally. Now, I want you here. This is a Bible study, okay? We're going to have a Bible study. And this is what God says to Abraham. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. You know? To Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Apostle Paul, I, Paul, say to you that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Wait a minute! God said it forever. I don't care. I'm the new guy in town. We're going to do things my way. We did it my way. So there's an eternal covenant proclaimed by God in one part and canceled out in the other part. That's oh, great. <laughs> So after that, I should hear from somebody. <laughs> we'll see you. Bye-bye.